It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. I got so caught up in the music, you know, in the in, in the Ode to Joy that I was like I was like flat footed when when we when we when we came on the air. But you know, welcome to the Hero Show, everybody, starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. Uh and we have a twofer today, a whole bunch of heroes here. We have the relentless Robin Begley. We have the indefatigable and undefeated John and undefeatable John Hersey. So how you doing uh, this afternoon, gentlemen? And I use that term in a very loose manner. But how you doing today? <laughs> Excellent. How you doing, Do- Andy? <laughs> doing, doing good, well. Andy. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Happy New I'm- Year to everybody. And what a way to break out the new year, like just blasting off uh, with the, yeah. the heroism, the music as we heard of Beethoven. One of the immortals, you know, in the, in the history of, of music, one of the all-time greats, you know, the Babe yes. Ruth, uh, the Michael Jordan, perhaps, of, uh, you know, of, of music. Certainly, certainly one of the, one of the greatest. The, uh, uh, yeah, the Ode to Joy, just as a personal, um, you know, reference is maybe my all-time favorite musical composition. And, and so I was just, yeah. I got so caught up. I was so enthralled and listening to it. I said, well, wait, wait a minute. We have a show. We have a show to do. <laughs> so Beethoven's date, 1770-1827. There he is. There's the great man. Yes. 56, unfortunately, dies very young. I know you guys know a lot more about his childhood than I do. I know he was born in Bonn, so he was German, was taught by his father and had a tough relationship with his father. Uh, similar, similar to Mozart, but I'll let you guys, I'll let you guys pick up the the thread of the story there. Yeah, I think actually Mozart's relationship with his father, at least early on, was a lot more amicable than was Beethoven's with with his father early on. Uh, I think Leopold Mozart was just a better human being than than Johann Beethoven was. Mm-hmm. Uh, Johann Beethoven was definitely inspired by Leopold Mozart's, you know, demonstration of what could be done molding a child from a very early age to be a virtuoso, to be a prodigy. And he had uh, a similar idea in mind for young Beethoven, you know, so so Mozart was, what, 14 years older than Beethoven. So uh, by this point, Johann, who was a court musician in Bonn, had, you know, sort of seen Mozart's star ascend and, and saw what was possible. And, you know, at first he was his son's teacher and then he, he hired multiple other teachers. Um, there was one by the name of Tobias Pfeiffer, who was sort of his dad's drinking buddy, also a bit of an insomniac. And they would wake up Beethoven, he was five, six years old at this point, wake him up in the middle of the night and force him to come to the piano and and play, and he'd be you know standing there in in tears, uh, having his his knuckles wrapped with a ruler or something whenever he hit a wrong note. So, whereas uh, you know Mozart, both of them were naturally gifted musicians, but whereas Mozart really took to the the instrument of his own accord. In this case, you know it's it's actually people are quoted as saying that. Beethoven, the, the music was actually beaten into him. And I think that's to a certain extent true. Of yeah, course, you know, I was just, I was just thinking, John, what, I was just thinking while you, while you were, were speaking that, uh, first of all, it's child abuse. You're, you're dragging the kid out of bed in the middle of the night when he obviously needs his mm-hmm. sleep and you're smacking him, smacking him with a rule or whatever, whenever he, uh, he makes an error. But I'm sure that I'm just thinking, you know, I'm sure the neighbors must have loved that. You got, you got this, uh, you know, piano blare at 3 a.m. <laughs> You know, when they're, when they're yeah. when they make it, when and they lived on top kid. of, like, they, they lived above their landlords. And uh, in fact, uh, their landlords complained yeah. at the noise. And Tobias Pfeiffer would walk around in his boots. Well, they finally persuaded him to, to take off his boots, but he only agreed to take off one. So he's still waking these people up in the middle of the night. Luckily, <laughs> oh he was God. only there for a few months. Uh, you can't, yeah, make he, this he was stuff Beethoven's up. instructor. Yeah. And then uh, he took the way, off. Young, uh, young, young, young Ludwig grew to be a virtuoso pianist as well as a composer. Did, did he not? I mean, he became a great pianist. He did. Right? Yeah. And Johann didn't want him yeah. composing. He he saw the all the money to be in performing, and so he largely 
uh, try to keep his son from composing. Uh, luckily, mm-hmm. you know, the, the greatest teacher, the most formative impact of any of his, uh, his teachers was Christian Gottlob Nefa, who began teaching him when he was 10 mm-hmm. or 11 years old. And, and Nefa was a composer as well. And so he actually worked some composition into young, young, young Ludwig's training. Um, some people think that actually when he started teaching them, it was only a matter of months before Beethoven was, was basically a, a better keyboardist all around than, than Nefa. Um, when Nefa had to, he, was, he had a prior engagement, he had to go to another town he persuaded the the court uh, musicians to let Beethoven sit in for him while he was gone. And uh, perhaps some people raised their eyebrows at first that this 11 year old kid was going to step in and, and, you know, play with the court musicians, but he quickly dispelled any fears, stepped in, he did an excellent job. And in fact, a few years later, when uh, the, the elector of Bonn, Max Franz did a sort of inventory of his musicians. He considered getting rid of Nefa and just having uh, Beethoven play instead. Mm. At that point, he was 13 years old. So this is well, you know, Nefa Nefa got Nefa got Wally pipped. You know, if anybody, <laughs> anybody, anybody knows that that baseball that <laughs> reference, but you know. While he Pip lost his job to Lou Gehrig, Nefa lost it to Ludwig van Beethoven. You at least, you know, you're not you're not losing your job to some you know some, some minor league talents. You know. So. Now, I, I one other thing though, Bonn was not the center. Bonn in Germany was not the center of musical culture. Vienna was, and people knew even at that age, eleven, thirteen, that Beethoven. His future, just think of his predecessors. You have Bach, you have Haydn, and you have Mozart. The talent and, and the creativity that he's inheriting and ultimately aims to surpass. So seeing that, seeing his talent, and each of his teachers saw that, and Beethoven liked it. Uh, here, here's the other thing is that he liked playing music he he loved music he knew that would be his future and the era was changing too if you bring the context of the enlightenment uh the the nobility and the just the structure of the system there was a an emerging middle class uh, as john mentioned about the the idea of him wanting to compose he saw the, that as a means of income which prior, you know, his, his father didn't see that. He, he didn't see that. He thought it was in performing and eventually teaching too. So that's just a little more of a background here about Beethoven's youth and how, how it would affect his, his future. Yeah. Well, fortunately, Bond was a relative. Ludwig... Go ahead, John. Go ahead. I, I was going to add to that. So Bond was definitely a, a backwater, musically speaking, but it did it did have the seat of the elector and Mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty important. Also, you mentioned the enlightenment. Nefa was, he was a Calvinist. He came to a largely Catholic region and was able to earn his seat as the court organist within a a couple of months, very, very quickly. So obviously he was extremely talented uh, and was a huge musical influence on Beethoven. But as importantly, he was a he was a devotee of the Aufklärung, the German Enlightenment, and mm. uh, you know Beethoven was his home life was was not very good. As he loved his mother, but his father was degrading. He was a drunk, uh, really just all around terrible human being, and got worse as the the years went on. So to be able to leave all of that and to go to, to see Nefa, who was steeped in Goethe and Schiller, and then also the von Brüning family took him in, and Helene von Brüning really raised him as one of their own and, and helped to kind of polish his rough edges to some extent and uh, introduce him to Plutarch and Homer, all these things mm-hmm. that he didn't experience because he was taken out of school at the age of 10 to, to be uh, you know, trained by Nefa. So uh, Nefa was a huge part in, in, in culturating Beethoven with the ideals of the Enlightenment that he would hold for the rest of his life. 
Um, and mm-hmm. you know, he would he would actually be a little bit out of place in that regard in Vienna, although it was a music capital. It was a very it was not a very uh, intellectually stimulating place. It was commonly described as a sort of frivolous place. And, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, what was it? Um, the emperor there, I forget the, the title. Um, you know, he at one yeah. point made a joke that if they tried to levy a tax for prostitution, they'd have to put a roof over the entire city in order to, <laughs> to collect the, the business tax. So it was, uh, it was notoriously not a very intellectually stimulating place. And it was also a seat of, of totalitarianism to some extent. Uh, it sort of became a police state in the, in the latter part of Beethoven's life. So we'll get to more of that, I'm sure, as we go on. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, the, yeah the, mentioned- the context here is one of German enlightenment. Go ahead. Yeah, John, and, and you mentioned Goethe. Now, now of course, uh, now, there's somebody would do a, a hero show episode on also uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, one of the you know, you know he's considered in, in literature they talk about the four greatest writers of, of history and whether whether they're right or wrong but you know the 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 immortals are generally considered chronologically Homer Dante Shakespeare Goethe. Uh, so he's, you know, he is certainly, you know, the, the author of Goethe's Faust, obviously. Uh, what, what were his dates? Just off the top of my head, I think it was 1749, 1832. Um, uh, you would know that. No, no some, yeah. some people's dates I remember, they stick in my mind. Some don't, but a magnificent writer and, a, you know, a Renaissance man and a paragon of, of the German Enlightenment, which unfortunately didn't take hold. Ultimately, the philosophy of Kant, Hegel, and Marx came to dominate in in, in Germany. But yeah, Beethoven meets Goethe uh, in in his uh, in his in his mature years and has a has a great respect for him. And I know Goethe wrote something about how he how impressed he was with on the one hand with Beethoven's musical genius, but on the other hand, his personality was uh, not. Well, I forget. I forget what I forget what the, Goethe put it in in the way that a great writer would. That he's not something like. I Beethoven, happen to have the quote here, Andy. Role. Oh yeah, go <laughs> go ahead. I, I happen to have that. He said his talent amazed me. Unfortunately, he is an utterly untamed personality who is not altogether <laughs> wrong in holding the world to be detestable, but surely does not make it any more enjoyable by his attitude. Right, mm. but you know, no. perfectly, perfectly said by 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 Goethe. Uh, recognized Beethoven's genius, but his tameless. What do you say, untamed or tameless personality? Untamed might personality. Be in, untamed. Yeah, might be putting him mildly. <laughs> you, 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 you know, as Beethoven was notoriously difficult to, to get along with. But uh, but uh, he was, yeah, and that so, was okay. said at a at a very bad period in Beethoven's life, which we'll we'll get to in due time. Mm-hmm. But he, if we if we go forward, when he's about sixteen years old, he makes the trip to Vienna to meet his idol, uh, Mozart. Uh, with with the this is seventeen eighty seven, so we know what's happening in America that year. Uh, what's happening in Germany in Vienna? Uh, Beethoven goes and uh, plays for Mozart, wants him to be his teacher. And there were different accounts, but basically Mozart liked him and said, "Watch, you know, watch out for that one. He he will he'll make his mark uh, on the culture." And sadly, right around that time, um, Beethoven had to cut his visit short because his mother was gravely ill and eventually passed away. And here's a pivotal moment in his life because he has two younger brothers, and his father is. Uh, irresponsible drunk and he assumes um he, he assumes the he's the care the up the uh the breadwinner uh by music so imagine that you're 16 years old you're going to make your living in music and you have two younger brothers to take care of that's his situation Yeah, his timing was notoriously bad throughout his life. I mean, imagine this. Mm -hmm. You go and you meet your idol, but yet you're called home after just a few weeks. He had finally won some sponsorship from the elector, Max Franz in Bonn, who sponsored his trip to Vienna. And Mm -hmm. he gets there. And this this is actually a really frustrating 
episode of of history because we don't have any firsthand accounts really of this historic meeting of Mozart and Beethoven. Um, they meet apparently. Mo uh, I mean, this is a very bad time for Mozart. He's recently moved to a new house that cost him four times as much as his old one. He can't afford it. Um, he's got two young kids running around. He's trying to finish his Don Giovanni opera. And, uh, you know, here shows up this kid, essentially, 16 years old, who, you know, some say wasn't quite as good as Mozart was at that age. Some say he was a little better. But he plays a piece for him. It's obviously something he's rehearsed. He does really well. And then, uh, but, but he's not impressed by it. So he says, well, Beethoven says, well, give me a theme to improvise over, which Mozart does. And he starts just brilliantly imp improvising over this theme. And apparently he walks into the next room and he had some guests over and says, you know, you know, watch out for this one. He's going to make his mark <laughs> on the world. It's going to show the world what's up with music, which we know he did. Yes. But yeah, horrible timing. Yep. He's, he's got to mm -hmm. leave almost immediately. Well, he's he he moves to Vienna permanently uh, when he was when he was well not permanently but he moves to Vienna when he was twenty one right to begin his yes so seventeen ninety two you're 1991. right it it actually was permanently in the sense that he never went back yeah. to Bonn uh, to live right and yeah. and that's yeah. that, that, that's never the, even uh, visited that's the, year that yeah. Mozart, that's the year that Mozart died didn't he die in seventeen ninety two uh ninety one seventeen ninety one he died no, no, no. so okay. they the, okay. they were still mourning. I mean, when Beethoven arrived, they were still mourning Mozart's death. And Haydn, who was the most famous composer, most established composer, older, like 60 years old, he starts um, giving Beethoven lessons. And that's an, they, that was an interesting relationship as well. Um, yeah. I mentioned earlier when I was a yeah. kid, we they they'd ask where you know how come Beethoven couldn't find his his music teacher because he was Haydn. Okay. Nice play, nice play <laughs> on words. Yeah. Did, did they have a did they have a good relationship, Beethoven and and, and Haydn? It's it was not a great relationship. So um, you know, as we said earlier, Beethoven's timing was never very good. He gets to Vienna, and Haydn's very interested in, in Beethoven, in ensuring that he has a splendid career, and actually helps introduce him to some people. But he is trying to finish up. I believe it was five or seven symphonies that he had promised to people in England. He had uh, a trip mm -hmm. planned to go back to London to, to deliver these. And there was some talk of perhaps Beethoven actually accompanying him to London. Um, however, he spent that first year teaching Beethoven counterpoint and counterpoint at that time was sort of on its way out in music. Uh, it was sort of considered old fashioned, but both Mozart and Haydn really demonstrated how important it was to music. So Beethoven is excited to learn counterpoint, um, except for the, the fact that Haydn is not very detail oriented when he's correcting Beethoven's assignments. And so Beethoven realizes this. He, he doesn't like it very much that Haydn's obviously not paying very much attention to his work. And, um, you know, this trip is still being sponsored by the Elector back in Bonn who wants to see some finished compositions for his, all the money he's spending to have Beethoven there. Uh, but that doesn't really happen since he's working on these counterpoint exercises. Beethoven gives Haydn some compositions he had actually composed back in Bonn to send back to the Elector. The Elector, who was no fool, he was actually an amateur musician himself, had heard these things before and he's, he writes back saying, you know, what are you trying to pull one over on me? And this really deteriorates the, the relationship between Beethoven and Haydn to a certain extent. And so Haydn leaves for London uh, by himself. He sort of hands him off to another counterpoint teacher. Beethoven continues his studies. But Haydn's departure also opens up the, uh, the, the possibility of Beethoven then becoming the uh, you know, best known musician in Vienna, which he quickly does. And also his originality. One thing, Andy, that they clashed about was Haydn was the old guard. He was the classical era. Mm. He was the, the the height of the classical era. And Beethoven has his own ideas and they're not the same. So yes, he learns the, the counterpoint and the technical uh, chops, so to speak, from 
Haydn and, and Mozart, but he's his own man. And one of the things we have to mention, Beethoven's independence. He was as independent a musician as there ever was. And he had his own vision and he was not going to conform to the prior, you know, this lineage of Bach, Haydn and Mozart. He wanted to push forward with his own vision. And at that time, as John set it up, Vienna was the place for that. So he starts to establish himself as not only the, the, the best musician, but as a composer and eventually as an incredibly innovative composer. Now, I, I always loved Beethoven's piano music, you know, the, the piano sonatas, which, yeah. you know, I, I think are, are very beautiful. I, I know Beethoven's career is often by musicologists is divided into, they say it's divided into three, into, into three sections. So, so when was he composing, you know, his, uh, this, this beautiful piano, uh, which, which era was this? Or was, was, it, was it throughout that he was composing this beautiful piano music? And, and so when, he gets when to was Vienna the, the, in, and, and and his gets his to Vienna in, obviously in seventeen very yeah seventeen sorry. what ninety two maybe ninety two yeah yeah he gets there in ninety two by ninety four he's he's sort of set his New Year's resolution so to speak he says uh, in seventeen ninety four he wants to become the whole man and what he means by that he's already established himself as the greatest pianist, the, the greatest virtuoso musician, in fact, in Vienna by this point. He's passed around to different salons by aristocrats. He gets there, he actually has this incredible hookup. Uh, his friend Count Waldstein back in Bonn um, introduces him to his distant relative, uh, whose name I'm, I'm gonna forget right now, uh, Prince Lishnowski it was. And he goes and he's actually living in the home of Prince Lishnowski, who's probably the greatest patron of the arts in all of Europe. And Lishnowski is, uh, you know, putting him through his paces in various salons. He actually sets up a European tour for him. Uh, Beethoven goes and does the rounds through, through Europe. He ends in Berlin, where he performs for uh, Wilhelm II, the Emperor of Prussia at that time, and knocks the socks off of Wilhelm. Absolutely loves him. In fact, he tries to offer him a job to stay there permanently in his court, and Beethoven refuses. He says that uh, he, he couldn't possibly live among such spoiled children who would weep at his piano play. <laughs> he doesn't know how to take, he doesn't know how to take the, the, uh, the compliments very well. And, um, but it's really John, in 1795. John, I remember, I remember, John, I remember reading... I remember reading once a long time ago about Beethoven. He had he had some some tiff with with some I don't remember which prince it was. And he he told the guy he says you know you you are you are prince so and so by virtue of birth, but I'm who I am because I'm Beethoven or you know, something like that. He told me. he told the told the prince so you know so he there has actually uh, I have the quote here already. There have oh, oh, have yeah. been and will be many thousands of princes, but there is only one Beethoven. Okay. That's okay. Nice, That's actually nice six, when the French the had occupied, when the French had occupied um, uh, Vienna, and he was very resistant. I mean, we could talk about what's also happening in that era is the French Revolution, which pivotally shifted mm -hmm. uh, all of Europe and the rise of Napoleon, who Beethoven initially liked and admired and wrote a symphony for him, his third symphony, and then came to despise yeah, the, because the, the, Napoleon was a tyrant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we so, should mention one political point here, because uh, you guys mentioned the Enlightenment, and you could see the Enlightenment influence here. You know, the the refusal to kowtow to the aristocracy. You know, the rising yes. liberalism in the true meaning of that term, the support of liberty and individual rights. Yeah. And Beethoven was certainly yeah. aligned with that, with with the liberalism in politics and the anti monarchy, anti aristocracy. And he, you know, and he uh, expressed Absolutely. his contempt for the aristocracy when yeah. he, uh, when he, when he, when he felt it. So, yeah, but the princes still had power back then. So, I mean, that takes some uh, gumption, as he would put it, to, to tell tell those kind of things to the prince of the prince of the realm. I mean, this is before the Council uh, of of Vienna, right? This is, but but I mean, the the, the aristocracy still had power then. So, 
You're right. And Andy, just on that note, on, on the the quote, the, the scene that you're talking about, the prince had actually demanded that Beethoven perform for him, kind of like a monkey, like a servant. And Beethoven refused. Right. And that was how he ended the discussion by saying, there will be many thousands of princes. There's only one Beethoven. I, I am who I am. And, and again, his assertiveness, his independence comes through as a person despite whatever people might have thought of him and he, he didn't get along with anyone i mean there's nobody he got along with and that's that's cert certainly a character flaw but a part of his you know if we look at his his background his upbringing it's very unfortunate but also a part of his independence was the fact that he you know marched to his own beat and that and that enabled him to be so that was one factor in his creativity as well yeah, how he dealt with people and manifested his independence. He was more Henry Cameron than he was Howard Rourke. Yes, yes, you know? he was. I mean, yes. Cameron, yes. Cameron, for admirers of the Fountainhead, Cameron threw ink stands and you know at bankers and you know called them names and yelled at them when they when when they wanted him to wanted him to conform to architectural tra tradition. Whereas Rourke right. kept you know stayed very calm and reasoned you know reason with, with them, but. Yeah, Beethoven is uh, he's uh, he's very mixed as a, as a as a person, but the genius and the uh, the independence and the integrity, like you're pointing out, Robert, um, his his commitment to his own principles is is just towers mm -hmm. over any of his flaws, which is why mm -hmm. you know we celebrate him as the you know the, the, as the great musical genius and as a and as a great man, you know, who's just went, went his yeah. own way musically. Now you guys know. The, the musical the classical tradition a lot better than, than I do isn't Beethoven one of the ones who spearheaded the 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 ger germinating romantic romanticism in, in music you know as 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 opposed to the classicism that you were talking about of of Bach Haydn and Mozart yeah to some extent so you're talking about the musical periods earlier and the second period the middle period is called often called Beethoven's heroic period. And, you know, sort of one of the works mm -hmm. kicking off this period was that Eroica Symphony that was initially dedicated to Napoleon Bonaparte uh, when Beethoven found out that Napoleon had crowned himself emperor. He famously scratched out the dedication to Napoleon so hard that he actually tore through the page. Uh, he was very ambivalent toward Napoleon after that. He, he actually sort of went back and forth and uh, eventually dedicated it to the memory of a great man, uh, realizing yeah, when, that when Napoleon, Napoleon was when not... Napoleon was still alive, when Napoleon was still alive, yes, right? yes. he dedicated it to the memory of a great man, as if Napoleon had died uh, again. Exactly. Showing some, showing some courage here, given that uh, you know Napoleon was a menace. Yeah, well, Napoleon's mm -hmm. a very mixed case, but I mean, he's he's certainly he's certainly a menace to uh, could have been a menace to Beethoven in Vienna. Since uh, you know the, yeah. the la, 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 la Grande Armée defeated the Austrians <laughs> soundly, right, a, a, a number of mm -hmm. times. Yeah, I would say that the event that most kicks off this period for Beethoven, and and with it, uh, in a sense, the Romantic period, was his travel to Heiligenstadt, which is a, a suburb. He went out basically to, uh, to to the wilderness for a while. His, he finally got some sound advice from from his doctor. So where I left off earlier was that he had done this concert tour and, well, he, he was basically on top of the world. And musically, his compositions preceded him. People started to understand and admire Beethoven all over Europe. And it was at that very moment when he was on top of the world that tragedy struck. And he began slowly, progressively over time, to lose his hearing. And by 1802, it was frighteningly bad. And really for the first mm -hmm. time, he got some sound medical advice from one of his many doctors who said, you know, you need to step away from the stress. You need to get out of this loud, noisy city that is Vienna. And I happen to have a friend who's got a place in Heiligenstadt. Why don't you go there? And Beethoven goes there with the intention of healing and getting better. But his friend comes, there's really a kind of a heartbreaking story. His, his friend is there and they're out in a field on a walk and his friend sees that there's a shepherd playing flute in the field and mm -hmm. Beethoven can't hear it. And he stands there and he walks back and forth and he gets closer and he walks 
back further away. And this goes on for about 30 minutes. And he comes to the conclusion that he's, he's just not going to regain his hearing. His friend is hearing this, you know, beautiful flute wafting through the breeze and he is not. And he comes to, uh, you know, in his months there, he leaves in October of that year. He, he comes to write what's known as the Heilingstadt Testament, wherein he flirts, you know, he, he basically says that he had flirted with the idea of suicide, but that he had decided to live for his art. And there's this beautiful quote that I want to read from that. And he says that, uh, should there exist in the world any man as unfortunate as I, let him comfort himself in the knowledge that, as I have done, he too can accomplish everything that is within his power and be elevated into the ranks of worthy artists and great men. And so he comes to terms with his growing deafness and decides that he's still going to do whatever he can in his power. And when he returns to Vienna, not long after that, he tells a friend that I'm not satisfied with the work I've done so far. And from now on, I intend to take a new way. And this new way is, you know, this is him saying, okay, well, and he never, he never decidedly breaks with classical music. He's always inspired by Haydn and by Mozart, but he also has his own but, vision John, of what music me, can and should be. John, let me jump in here for, for a second, and you know, and then you get back to the classical romantic uh, issue in Beethoven. But just think of the the tragic irony here mm -hmm. of the of the man who would compose beautiful music for the world to hear but who could not himself hear it. I, I, I mean, just think, just think of that. It's almost, it's almost Greek, you know, it's like yeah. it's the gods. Or hugo -esque. The gods pun <laughs> yeah, right, right. The gods right? punish somebody for, the, for some, some great genius for his hubris that because he was such a great composer, he thought he was equal to the gods. So they punish him by making him deaf so that he can't hear, you know, the beauty of his own music. I mean, this, the, just the, the tragic irony of that. Um, and, and before you continue, John, I just I, had, I found this quote uh, where he, where, from Beethoven. Where he told a friend, you know, where he's wrestling with the horror of you know the great composer and the, the great pianist. I mean, he can't. I mean, he he continues to compose, but he can't perform in public anymore, right? He can't he can't play he can't play the piano in public. Mm -hmm. He can't uh, conduct uh, be, because of the disability. But he told, he told the friend that he was determined to, quote, seize fate by the throat. It, it shall certainly not crush me completely, unquote. And this, Robert, you were talking about that spirit, you know, that, yes. that just that, yeah. inner, that inner fortitude, however he manifested it socially. And obviously, it's not a guy, you know, you might want over for Thanksgiving, uh, you know, Christmas dinner, because he may overturn, he may, get, <laughs> he may get upset, somebody overturn the table. You know, you don't know what he's going to do socially. But, uh, uh, but wow, you know, what a man, you know, the, the inner strength to, to go on and continue to compose uh, is just, yeah. is a real testament to his, his inner, his, his moral character, as well as his genius. And it affected, it really yeah. affected his personal life because being deaf or losing, gradually losing your hearing, which he never, he never totally lost or all of his hearing, but just this gradual uh, loss of it publicly was, as you mentioned, not being able to perform, but even relationships. I mean, part of his, part of the tragedy is he never had a fulfilled romantic relationship. And some of his most beautiful music, Moonlight Sonata, he wrote with one of his students he was in love with. And um, but because of this embarrassment of not being able to hear and and uh, the way those people were treated, even if you are a Beethoven, there is there is certainly uh, a stigma there. And he faced that. And that, unfortunately, I think also reflected on his outlook on life as well, just making him more more bitter as a person it'd be hard to be mrs beethoven you know dealing <laughs> well, you know, first of all the the yeah. the deafness is, is is an issue but the stormy tempestuous personality you need to walk on eggshells because you never know when your husband is gonna be infuriated and you know and, and throw a chair at you or, or or something you can see why beethoven's personal life was was unfulfilled but it's it's sad mm -hmm. i mean he's such a such a great man and you know rom certainly romantically unfulfilled mozart's life 
was uh, very sad. But he but he was happily married to Constanza, was was he not? Yes, he, he was a womanizer too. But that was you know Mozart yeah, was the first rock star right. in that sense. That's <laughs> but but which led to a lot of jealousy, and Beethoven did not experience that, and sadly. One of the things, if we go back to his family, he had two younger brothers who he was the caretaker for. When each of them got married, Beethoven uh, somewhat shunned them because they had personal fulfillment. They they had marriages and he did not, and they had fulfilled romantic relationships. So sadly, that was a factor in his life. But as you know, if we move on to his symphonies, I think that that is you know the heroica. I think is. It's groundbreaking. It's longer than any other symphony ever was. So now he's even changing the dynamic, the length of a symphony and the structure of it. And um, there's a violent element that didn't exist before. And, you know, constantly we're hearing these themes. It's hard to describe in, in words because it's, it's better to just, you know, to hear these things like we heard in the, in the Ode to Joy. But there's this clash and this eventual resolution. I mean, that's the thing that appeals to me about Beethoven is that there's constantly this struggle, but ends with some kind of resolution that uh, that I find appealing. Yeah, you can't tell a story. You don't have a plot until you have conflict. And I think a lot of people write off Beethoven because they listen, they listen to the first part of this or that symphony and they hear that conflict and that torment, but they don't wait yes. around for the resolution, which are, which, yeah. you know, in the, the fifth symphony in particular is just yeah. this glorious fulfillment. And, yes. you know, again and again, you'd see this in, in Beethoven's music. Um, yeah, yeah you, in fact, there's no... Uh, you know, let's, make, let's make one, one point here. Ayn yeah, Rand yeah. said, you know, she, did, she, didn't, she didn't like Beethoven's music because she, she found it malevolent. She never said... I have a quote. She never that, said Beethoven's but, yeah. Oh, okay. but she we'll never said Beethoven later. wasn't a magnificent wasn't a magnificent composer. She said it wasn't to her personal taste. Yes, uh, but you yes. know, I, I could I could hear that in, in 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 some of Beethoven's music. I can understand that all. You know, I, I you know I disagree. It's, it's you know it's my, to my personal taste. But the Ode to Joy, if even if that's even that's not true, the Ode to Joy just makes up for it. You know, for me, it's so it's such beautiful. You know, not just beautiful music, but as the as the name indicates. It's it's a you know it's this uh, glorification of all the the happiness and the and the joyfulness the joie de vivre as the French put it that's possible on earth so uh, you know so mm -hmm. Beethoven's mix a mixed case in that regard yeah and and ever since eighteen oh eight when the fifth symphony was finished there are no more recognizable four notes in music history right. everybody knows that bum 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 whatever whether you like it or right. not you recognize it and that is a statement in itself the the lasting the legacy of such a powerful uh introduction that shocked you know shocked people and uh, well, here's another, know, eventually came around wait it's another great irony guys if i remember my history that became the music of the you know the the V the V for victory sign right in uh, in World War Two, right? Hmm. Um, hmm. Was that was that from the fifth? Which if that's if that's the case, then notice the the Allies using the music of a great German composer, you know, as <laughs> uh, you know as their rallying cry, as it were, against Germany. Germany having you know been taken over by the by the Nazis by that time. But I, I mean, I could I could be wrong, but I, I, I think they I think the allies did use that music as part of the as part of their V for victory uh, uh, crusade, didn't they? In the, in the second yeah, world war? I, I can't say for sure it would I, I could believe it and kind of turning the tide on on dictatorship Germany, which clearly Beethoven would have, would have opposed as well. Can well, you see him I sucking up to Hitler? Hitler? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, <laughs> just I, I no way. Remember. I, I think. Yeah, yo, no, no, Beethoven, Beethoven doesn't kiss up even to mixed case, you know, aristocrats yeah. or mixed case parvenus like uh, like Napoleon. Mm -hmm. Never mind to pure evil, you know, like like Hitler. Yeah, I, actually, I Andy. So since since yeah. since you brought right. it up, I right. thought 
give I thought maybe we could uh, do a little bit more of a sidetrack here on Rand because when I took understanding objectivism, that's when I first met you back in 1983. And when Leonard Peikoff said how much Ayn Rand despised the music of Beethoven, I was shocked because I can understand her not liking rock music, which that I knew about, but I did not know until that course. And I just have in, in I just want to read quickly uh, to give the the listeners her um, wider context here on Beethoven is that she says, um, with regard to Beethoven, I profoundly, I'm profoundly opposed to his music, specifically from a sense of life aspect. That's what you said. Aesthetically, I can hear that he is a great musician, and I have to, I have to acknowledge the skill with which he is presenting what he is presenting. But his music is what I call malevolent universe. Uh, it is in essence the view that man is doomed, that he has no chance, that he cannot achieve his goals, and that he cannot triumph on earth, but must struggle just the same. And she goes on about Byron, making the, the similarity to Byron. Yeah. And like you, Andy, I don't, I don't hear that. I don't, I don't think Beethoven aimed at that either. I mean, this could be like a subconscious point that Rand is, is, is interpreting, but I think also, not to say music is subjective, but it really depends on the context of the listener as well. So I just thought to to kind of yeah, you unpack know, that a it. little bit. I no, I, I hear it in some of his symphonies. I think in the in the mm -hmm. third and and the fifth. I mean, I'm no musicologist. I so I just go by you know by what I like, what what dislike. I can hear that in some of his music, but some but on the other hand, you know, some, some of Beethoven's piano music is so beautiful. It's like, you know, yes. I, sometimes I can't decide whether I think Beethoven or Chopin wrote the wrote the most beautiful, wrote the most mm. beautiful piano music. And then there's the culmination of his symphonic career, the the Ode to Joy, which is just it's just stunning. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so but anyway, look, look, Ayn Rand's a monumental genius in the field of literature and, and philosophy. And we, you know, we all we all love and, and admire her, but doesn't mean, you know, the, the the theme of the fountainhead itself is, you know, independence. You go by your own judgment. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily have to agree with any yeah. you know, genius, whether it's Rand or Aristotle or Newton or, or Beethoven or, yes. you know, or who, whoever it is. Yeah, so I think. Mm -hmm. We probably all disagree with Rand's assessment, and it'd be interesting for those fans of Rand to kind of dig into what she actually heard and how much of it she listened to. I would say that it seems likely to me that she probably didn't really give him a, a fair hearing. Um, but to bring this back to the question of Beethoven as a sort of transitional character between classicism and romanticism, you know, I think this is important that when the Romantic period really began to take off, actually Beethoven really rebelled against a lot of the, the new standards in Romanticism. He rebelled against, for one, the sort of mysticism that infused many of the Romantic works. He was never a very religious person. He made some references to God throughout his life, as was common in this day and age, but not a very religious man. And also, he did not like the sort of fragmenting of musical forms that was caused by the Romantics. He wanted to hold on to the form of the symphony and the sonata, and many Romantics were moving in the direction of much shorter works, song cycles, and uh, you know, just in general, less ambitious pieces, pieces that looked more inward at man's own emotions instead of outward at the world and the sorts of things that one could accomplish in one's life. So although Beethoven is seen as this character and he musically sparked this deepening of emotional expression with music, he did not agree with many of the ideas that actually explicitly fueled the Enlightenment or rather the Romantic movement. And one of the biggest, I think, and, and there's disagreement over the extent to which Beethoven was familiar with the ideas, but one of the biggest uh, influences on this period was was Kant's critique of practical judgment. Uh, I believe that was the title. It was his work on aesthetics. I'm forgetting now which which title that was, but this his ideas on the sublime in that book came to really influence a lot of musicians in the Romantic period. And and actually Beethoven had the opportunity when he was younger to study Kant at the University of Bonn 
and didn't. He decided to put his attention on music instead. And, and some people say he did and, and you know, he might have imbibed his ideas through this or that source. Whatever the case may be, uh, when those ideas were actually actuated in music and people were acting on them, uh, he did not uh, go with the flow. He stood his ground. He was always independent. And he really held on to classical forms uh, used in a way to, to convey emotions at a level that just no one had up to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A Andy, you mentioned the piano works. Uh, one of the most famous is for Elise. And it's personally important to me when uh, last millennia, when I got married, didn't last, but, but I had my brother's musician play, play that song as the bride walked down the aisle and I wasn't the first one to do that. I mean, it's just such a, a beautiful light uh, piece that Beethoven, uh, you know, it's one for the ages where you see, yes, yeah, soft, beautiful piano. He has that capacity and there's, there's yes. a joyous element there. And um, I think uh, talking yeah. about Bond, I, I, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Jump in. I have Yo, a different no, story. But it's anyway. interesting, Robert. I didn't, I didn't know that Wagner, Wagner's bridal uh, uh, chorus was sweet. I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, has become like the traditional music for the. Oh, Mendelssohn. No, the that's bride. actually Mendelssohn. The uh, that's Mendelssohn's uh, piece. The the bum bum ba dum dun 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 dun. Is that the one you're talking about? No, here, here comes the bride. Isn't that? Is, isn't that? Is oh, that okay. You're right. So I there's that, a different one. Right. But, yeah. But Actually, I mean, but become, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of beautiful music that's been, been composed. Yes, there is. But, you know, you, I, even despite the fact that, you know, Wagner's piece is so popular, you know, for the, you know, for the bride, the bridal entrance, you're probably, you're, you're certainly not the first, you're probably not the last, you know, who's going to use no. Beethoven's no, uh, I don't think so, yeah. you know, music at and at a wedding, you know, Beethoven. You're right. Beethoven's capacity for this beauty in, you know, in in, in music is, you know, I listen. I listen to Beethoven's piano music, and I think he he's the he's the greatest. And then I listen to Chopin. No, 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 he's the greatest. And I can't, you know, I can't I go back and back and forth on who wrote the most beautiful piano music. But that's like trying to decide whether you want to start your baseball team with Babe Ruth or Willie Mays. You know, I, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you can't, can't go wrong. You you can't go yeah. wrong. You, you can't go wrong with. Yeah. Uh, with e with either of them, so yeah, there's just this very, you know, you think of Beethoven, you think of these crashing symphonies and power, and I hear that that conflict that Ayn Rand is talking about that can be interpreted as malevolent, but then you, you, it, it's too easy to lose sight of the fact of the very gentle touch he has in his piano sonatas. Mm -hmm. You know, just the you know, there's just the very delicate beauty of uh, of them. <laughs> the piano was just in its infancy when Beethoven. Uh, yes. really came to the fore as a musician. So, you know, earlier musicians like Mozart and Haydn, they really were never great pianists because the, the piano, you know, it was there, but it was, it was still being developed. But when Beethoven took the scene, the piano was large, it had largely been perfect, perfected. And so he was able to hone mm -hmm. his technique on piano from a very, very young age and really to to show the expressive power of the piano. And I think that um, uh, Mendelssohn and, Ch and Chopin in particular was able to take that in, to a whole new level. But Chopin's music for me is much more inward looking, more introspective and emotional mm -hmm. and much quieter on a much smaller scale. Um, but, you know, For least also was another composition written for an unrequited love. And we talked yeah. earlier about Beethoven's personality and it being very tempestuous. And, you know, I just wanted to point out that he did have some some very good friends. But I think, you know, it's, it's hard to, to speculate what could have happened. But I would say that you can't really understand that tempestuousness without understanding how many times he was rebuffed in relationships over and over again, four or five times, he felt deeply head over heels in love with women who just weren't available to him. Some were married, yeah. some were just outside of his social class. Some just thought he was ugly. I mean, he was he was a mm -hmm. reportedly very ugly guy. And so, mm -hmm. so much of, of Beethoven's personality, I think, comes from the fact that he, he was just 
completely failed when it came to relationships. And perhaps you know, that's part of I wonder if John, why we have such beautiful piano music. <laughs> well, that's, that's again, tragic. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, it's like, it's like yeah. Cyrano in that case becoming, well, you know, Cyrano was a poet, right? And it's like Cyrano then becoming a composer to pour out his, to pour out his grief and the, the broken heartedness mm -hmm. of a man who was deformed and physically not attractive, broken heartedness in, in love. But I wonder if, if, if part of this is, if there's a reciprocal causation, uh, John, uh, you know, like you see these paintings of Beethoven, now, now clearly they, they may be, you know, this may be a, a glorified uh, vision of, of him, but the, 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 what I've seen of Beethoven didn't look particularly unattractive. You know, not like not like Cyrano was supposed to be with his 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 big old schnoz. Uh, but I wonder if his behavior <laughs> was, was. I wonder if his behavior was ugly. You know, and I know I know he it was unkempt. Yeah. yeah, no, I know he got unkempt later on in life. He didn't his 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 personal hygiene evidently when he was young was was good, but he let he let that kind of go to the dogs as he as as well, actually he didn't older, arc but, shape. It was. It was very mm -hmm. bad when he was young and it kind of peaked when he finally got to Vienna and had to like make his way among the aristocracy. And then after he lost his hearing and, and sort of could no longer pe yeah. be part of the social scene, then he just sort of let it go to the dogs. So he, yeah, I mean, he, he learned that. that unkemptness and sort of rudeness to a certain extent from a, a very young age and his, his manners sort of peaked for a time. His yeah. father was like that, but, but you know, if you're if you're easily enraged and over trifles and you know and you take it out on other people and you're verbally abusive and and, and so on, it just even just your facial expressions can you know, can, can be it's just kind of you're kind of a characteristically snarling personality. It could be it could be ugly and unattractive, uh, but but uh, I don't know. Is this are these paintings of this? I look at. I, I don't know how idealized this is on the part of the portrait. Part. Yeah, it is. He had this, a pockmarked this, this, this uh, face. Doesn't, yeah, that they do make him look, look similar with Mozart. Yeah, similar with okay. Mozart. They make him look better looking than they actually were. Yeah. But if you look at the writings of the time, of the descriptions, he was darker skinned and he had a, a pockmarked because he had smallpox when he when he was young, and, oh, okay. and that oh. that made him less attractive. He was short. So there was a lot, there were a lot of things that could be turned off. I mean, if you just listen to the music, that would be an appeal. But then when you meet the person, it's kind of like Gail Wine doesn't want to meet his heroes in real life, right? Because they're all, all always a letdown. And that, that tended to be, tended to be the case in Beethoven's, uh, in, in his life. And yeah, there's a longing there that, and there's a sadness that he did not enjoy as as we mentioned uh this totally fulfilled and rapture he had an ideal woman he had an idealized view of women similarly that he wanted them to be strong but submissive and i, I see parallels to hugo kind of hugo's description there where there's like, like a bit of a fierceness but then also be submissive as well and but hugo uh, hugo was married for many years was it wasn't he oh yeah yeah hugo yeah was married, no the yeah. way hugo depicts women what i mean is hugo's depiction uh of women not not his own yeah in, in his own well, i'm not uh, personal I'm, I'm, life. I'm not sure i'm not sure if hugo was hugo himself a womanizer i'm not i'm not sure yes he uh, was about, yeah according to a biography yeah, yeah. uh yes yeah. yeah i mean these guys were rock yeah. stars like you said before robert hugo mozart <laughs> you know comes these guys with were the rock terms, stars yeah. The, the, yeah the ladies <laughs> the ladies loved them but yeah I, I may have to retract what i said before about mozart being happily married he may have loved his wife's name was constanza right he may have yes, loved yes. he may have loved her as she may have loved him but if he's running around with other women you know how could you have a fulfilled marriage yeah there's uh, definitely that, that, yeah that yeah, yeah, definitely a problem but, there. But um, but yeah, but but so what are they in the Freudian terms, guys? They they, they talk about sublimation. It's and I, I, you know, I, again, I don't know, I don't know anything about Freudian psychology. But it's it sounds like Beethoven was able to take this personal pain, you know, this this lack of of romantic fulfillment, which can be very painful uh, and very lonely, and was able to sublimate it, was able to to tr transmute it. Uh, into this beautiful piano music, uh, you know, it's almost like he did spiritual alchemy. You know, he took this pain mm -hmm. and this ugliness and he turned it into beauty. And, you know, that is yeah. certainly that is certainly a, ma a magnificent artistic achievement on his part. 
Yeah, I could say on, on a personal note, uh, back in 2010, I had, I had planned a trip to Europe to go all over the country and Bonn was one of my second stop. It's not, it's south of Amsterdam. So I flew into Amsterdam and Bonn was going to be the next stop, but I had a friend join me, a woman, and it was real early in the relationship. And my plan was get hop on, hop off all the year rail. And when, when I saw her with this gigantic suitcase, my first thought was there goes, there goes Bonn, there goes Beethoven. So we went to Cologne, which was the next town south, which is very historical, but I missed my chance there to have like some kind of firsthand account. Uh, but Elliot, if you could put the, the, um, the Central Park the statue. So I give walking tours for, for decades of Central Park. And one of the places in around 70th Street, right in the middle of the park between 5th and, and 8th Avenue, a five minute walk from John Lennon's uh, Strawberry Fields Imagine, is this uh, statue of Beethoven, a bust of him with the brooding, you know, face. I mean, the, the other thing is his mood, it, it, it matches, you know, his, his facial expressions tend to match. And this was, this uh, statue came from the Germans. They wanted to, they wanted to uh, celebrate Beethoven and they, you know, commissioned this work, which is just a, a fabulous work. And what I like about it is I would get to show, share my admiration for Beethoven and somewhat uh, tell his story. So uh, the man is just, you know, as, as the, the three of us agree, uh, his music just puts him on a scale that had not happened before and the personal uh, foibles, whatever you could say, um, they, they're almost negligent by comparison and, and we're totally grateful to him for what he's done. Uh, do you want to move on to the core, the final, the choral uh, we, symphony? We here? should definitely Which... discuss. The, we should definitely discuss the Ode to Joy. You know, uh, yeah, as a capstone, capstone. Eighteen twenty four. Yeah, eighteen twenty four. So he he had a down period. Just to set a little more of the context, there was like a five year period where he was not productive, and there's unfortunate circumstances there because his brother Carl died leaving a young son named Carl and Beethoven wanted that son. He felt like he would be a proper father. And as I mentioned earlier, he did not like the wives of his brothers and considered the mother unfit and went to court. And because he was Beethoven, he won. So it's very, it's very unfortunate. And he, and he did not uh, treat. Could we just uh, dig into that? Yeah, go I, ahead. John. I just want to dig okay. into that one thing a little bit because it's not it's not entirely true that just because his brothers were successful he was sort of uh, envious in some respect it's actually the case that Joanna Carl's wife was reportedly mm -hmm. a, a very um, uh, immoral person and so you know just one anecdote when she was mm -hmm. when she was a young girl she actually uh, can, she she charged one of their housekeepers with stealing something from her father that she in fact took and this case went to trial and it wasn't until mm -hmm. on trial she was uh, forced to to contradict herself and tell the truth that in fact she took this thing and apparently her father said you know I'm not going to give you any money because uh, she wanted allowance as a young girl but if you can take it from me without me knowing then it's yours. Mm. So he basically yeah, incentivized like her to steal. Like, and this oh is, I God. think, an indication of her character. And Beethoven saw this when Carl uh, became engaged to Joanna. He he said, you know, uh, you, you should not do this. And when Carl came yeah. down with tuberculosis, I believe it was, um, mm -hmm. he made him swear to leave the, his son Carl to, to Beethoven so that he could bring him, him up properly. But, um, you know, although he did this in his will, uh, he, he actually, in his will, he, he said both joint custody for the two of them. And then within a day or so of dying, Beethoven found the will and asked him to take out Joanna, which he did. So the will actually left the son to Beethoven. And perhaps mm -hmm. for good reasons, we can't really know much about Joanna's character, but what we do know seems to point in the wrong direction. And, and so legally, it should have been Beethoven, he should have been in, uh, in charge of Carl's upbringing, 
but um, you know, he he had to go to court for this, and and this led to a horrific five six year period in Beethoven's life where he did very little work because of this court yeah. case. Yeah, well, you know. So let me get this straight. So so Joanna, she smears this poor housekeeper, smears her name all uh, you know all over the place, and uh, she's only the the housekeeper is only vindicated at at, at at trial. You feel yeah, you definitely empathize for the innocent the innocent girl. Whose, mm-hmm. whose name was was besmirched but you know so i'm thinking from what you're saying jo- joanna sounds like she's not a great mother for the young kid but ludwig von beethoven as a father i mean i mean he's a genius he's a, he's a genius and he's a great man in many ways but i don't know that he sounds you know what we know about his personality it doesn't sound like he's really fit to be a loving you know, father to, to to the to the kids. So the sounds like young Carl was caught between a rock and a hard place in, the, in, in this instance. Well, let's recall that when Beethoven's mother died, when he was sixteen years old, he was largely in charge of bringing up his his two younger brothers. Okay. Right. And yeah. you know, he he certainly developed as a person throughout his life, and and for many reasons, the failures in relationship, his lost hearing, he really went downhill. But you know, at least in his mind, at some point, he was a capable person uh, of bringing up uh, children in a responsible manner and at least had a better moral character than the woman who otherwise would be bringing up Carl. So I think that's okay. an important context because I, I don't think we should impugn Beethoven, uh, you know, 100%. I, I think there are definitely failings here and the way that he acted toward Joanna in, in this whole uh, this, this whole situation was pretty horrific, but I think he had some legitimate reasons for worrying about Carl being brought up in that household. Sorry, yeah, and two so, things came ahead, out Robert. of that, John. Uh, thank, thank you, by the way, for the for that correction. I, I definitely uh, that's proper context is needed. Two things that came out of the trial was Beethoven learned that he was born two years earlier. Uh, his father wanted to put him out there as a six-year-old new Mozart when he was actually eight. And Beethoven never knew that. They didn't have birth certificates. as They went by the bapt- date of baptism uh, back then. And similarly, he thought he was had royal lineage. He thought he was like the bastard child of some famous no- noble person. And, and also he found out that, no, that, that wasn't uh, the case either. So... Uh, another, but there's another he's... irony, Robert. There's another yeah. irony, Robert. Beethoven, <laughs> yeah. who's so contemptuous so often of the aristocracy. I know. Who fancy, <laughs> fancy right. themselves the right. bastard scion of an aristocrat. His life is yeah. filled with ironies. <laughs> yes, it, it totally is. But we get to uh, the ninth, you know, the, the, the culmination. Never in symphony history was there uh, vocals as well but he decided i'm going to change this the length of it was longer 70 something minutes in fact i think when they started people who remember cds when they start recording cds and producing them they went with the disc the the time uh length of his ninth symphony that was why cds are like you know 75 minutes long that was the bar that they that they actually oh is that right i, I didn't with. know that Interesting. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the, you know, ways that he still influences, you know, the culture to this yeah. day. Uh, yeah, really. Mm-hmm. So, so how was the ninth, how was the ninth received? Oh, uh, there was, there's one concert, there's an entire book about it uh, called um, Beethoven's Ninth and uh, 1824, uh, May of 1824 was the one performance he was at. And like most of his other works, I, I, some people embraced it initially. You know, initially it was far ahead of its time. They didn't know what to do, but the crowd burst into applause. Uh, the film *Immortal Beloved*, which we uh, haven't talked about, shows him uh, there, and he has to turn around to recognize the the yeah, thunderous applause hear. because he can't, he can't hear. Yeah. Right, he can't. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Again, the sad, mm-hmm. the sad irony. Yeah. Yeah. But it is joy. I mean, it is, you know, from Schiller, right? He took the text of that from from Schiller's work with that with that title. And uh, as you say, Andy, it's, you know, your potentially your favorite uh, piece of music. It's embraced, you know, across the globe. I mean, people know the ninth. It is the, the, the height of human 
you know, uh, pot potential, you know, it just has that reach that, that you want. And, and Beethoven consciously struggled, you know, sought that, wanted to write it, even though now he was near the end of his life. He only lived three more years and uh, his hearing was, you know, it was, it was just really, really bad uh, at that point. Yeah, yeah we see at, at this, this point, point Beethoven, Beethoven, let me just make one, one last point, John, because I've seen these flash mobs on YouTube. You know, and it's really, it's really beautiful. You know, some some lone violinist in a square in some European town yeah. playing. You know, starting to play the Ode to Joy, and a few people come to watch and listen, and then another musician comes out, and a few more people show up in the, in the audience, and eventually you have a full symphonic orchestra blaring out the Ode to Joy to a big mob. You know, and it's just, it's just a beautiful sight. You know, to, and to see how you know, the, be the beauty of the music and to see how many people still love Beethoven to this mm -hmm. day, the influence he still has, you know, to draw a crowd, the ability to draw a crowd, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I'm sorry, John, what were you saying? Well, uh, I'm not myself a music historian, but many music historians say that the Ninth Symphony was the greatest musical achievement in history. Because if you think about yes. it, it revolutionized the symphony. It was this long, complex symphony, symphony with this glorious ode to joy as its as its ending uh, section. And think about the circumstances under which he composed this. Uh, he began it in the you know he apparently it was in his thoughts from his young days all the way up in, until uh, it was you know performed in 1824. Um, but by this point he was only hearing like low rumbles and, and loud, you know, sharp percussive sounds. And he had all mm -hmm. sorts of ear trumpets and things to try to bring the vibration into his ear, but he really couldn't hear. So this symphony was composed in his head. And this is one of the ways in which humans differ so much. It's in this ability to have what's called this auditory memory, this, this, uh, mm -hmm. musical audition and, and hear something in one's own head. And Beethoven was able to compose an entire symphony that he wasn't able to hear in his head, more or less, without barely being able to hear anything else. And look what he did. So, you know, we talked a little bit about Mozart earlier. It's it's uh, just this horrible twist of fate in history that we lost Mozart mm -hmm. at 36, uh, 30, 36, 35. Beethoven... Yeah lost began losing his hearing at 28 and you know slowly progressively lost it uh, but the amount of music and, and the accomplishments that he was still able to to achieve thereafter it's just this incredible musical achievement and perhaps as the music mm -hmm. historians say one of the greatest in history without without a yes. doubt and i think that makes a, yes i think that makes a nice rap uh for, mm -hmm. for us and I, I wanted to salute the man who couldn't <laughs> hear, but who made hearing a joy for the rest of us. So thank you, yes, Ludwig van indeed. Beethoven. And may you all have a uh, heroic day and for all of us seek to lead a more heroic life and take fate by the throat like Beethoven told his friends. That's friend. right. You're not going to let it crush me. I'm going to you know, make my life turn out the way he did. And despite all the heartbreak and the pain and the suffering, the body of work uh, uh, speaks yeah. speaks for itself. So and listen to his music. A, Enjoy a, yourself. Yes, especially the ode to joy. Have a joyous day, everybody. See you next time. Thank you all.